Hello, everybody. We are back for another Wednesday. Uh, we are going to discuss scientific racism today. This is an interesting topic. I received a comment or a message I do not recall from Adam Rubin, which kind of inspired me and pushed me to cover this topic here. And not coincidentally, it is a topic that I will be covering in my course in about a week or two and so what i'll probably do i know this is so cheap but hey is i'm going to provide a link <laughs> in this course uh, or a link to this video and my students can watch it because i'm teaching online as a consequence of covid coronavirus hi lucy so this is one of those topics that I'm not sure how long it's going to to run. I, I'm going to cover a longer span of it, which will that I usually do not go fully into when I'm teaching this course, but it is worthwhile. And it is one of those that, because I've studied it so much, I have developed something of a blind spot. And, and what I mean is that since I have read so much of this material, I take for granted that the knowledge that I have read and studied over the years is much more generalizable out there in the public, hi Jay, than it tends to actually be. So this is, this is a heavy one. Uh, this is a heavy one. It's also a local one. I'm going to have lots of links and lots of photographs to share with you in the comment section afterwards. I try not to do it while I'm live streaming because it'll be distracting and interrupting, but yeah. So seeing six people here, hi Sushana. I am gonna get started uh, because, yes. So as always, sorry folks, my repeated customers, but you never know who's tuning in for the first time. And so I will include my standard introduction, which is the introduction to do with knowledge and learning and whom we can trust and not trust. Uh, I am streaming this on Facebook and those of you who are aware, are aware how much Facebook has become, hello Nicole, has become a cesspool of misinformation and lies. And that said, that doesn't mean there's not truth on Facebook. It's just that it's swamped under by misinformation. And so when we are presented with information, even information from people like me, uh, we should always consider who is presenting this information, why, and what are their sources, background, where do they draw this information? Because that can inform how much credibility you give to a person. And another kind of quick rule of thumb I read in an article is that if you are presented with a piece of information and it gives you a strong emotional reaction, automatically question it. <laughs> Hi, Kathy. Because if it's evoking an emotional response and not a thoughtful response, it might be trying to evoke emotional response and thus might not be fully credible. Uh, but that said, so who's this guy in front of you who is about to talk to you about scientific racism? Well, my name is Joseph Solar. I hold a PhD in urban education from Temple University, in, wherein I studied, well, schools and cities, but in a broader sense, sociology and history. I am an adjunct instructor at Rowan College of Burlington County, where I teach African American history and US history. Uh, this is where I met Lauren Purnell, who was one of my students who helped generate this website and this idea. And so we've been working together on creating this. I hold my undergraduate degree from Harvard University where I studied with people like Henry Louis Gates Jr. who hosts all those shows on PBS and Cornell West and Jamaica Kincaid and this fantastic historian that I that is not as widely known as she should be for her brilliance, Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Uh, James Loran Matori, who taught me a lot about the black diaspora. I mean, just, I studied with extraordinary human beings who taught me a great deal. And it is my, my privilege or also my responsibility to take all the things that they've taught me and the ways they've shown me to evaluate and judge and study uh, 
and to pass that knowledge further on. Uh, for some of the material I'm covering today, I owe a debt to one of my sociology professors from Temple University, Michelle Bing, who taught me a course, a graduate course called Sociology of Race and Racism, and she's marvelous as well, uh, so local. But uh, with that introduction out of the way, scientific racism. Uh, Adam Adam Rubin, I don't know if he's here today, but he he asked me a he asked me a question about this uh, Portuguese chronicler named Gomez de Zarazura, who wrote a book in which he first defined Africans as as black or as lumped them together as one group, and it's a story that the the anti racist writer from Boston University Ibram X Kendi discusses in significant detail. And so one of the things I mentioned to Adam was that I never had studied Gomez de Zarazura because I focused more on the American side of it. But going back to what I was saying at the very beginning of the course, one of the major points, ah, there's Adam. One of the major points that Ibram Kendi makes with telling that story and which relates to this thing that I take stuff for granted and do not really <clears throat> recognize how, how little the information is out there is that uh, racism and our overprivileging of skin color as somehow definitional of a person's life experience and capacities and <clears throat> and all of that is in no ways a natural occurrence. It is in no way something that simply emerged or to 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 undercut one of the all too common refrains we hear. Everybody's not just a little racist. And also, uh, racism has not always just been. Uh, and we have to recognize, and, and when Kendi tells the story of, of Gomez, that racism is a creation, a deliberate creation related to economic and power concerns. And the Gomez story he tells is that perfect example of it. A few weeks ago I talked about, or months ago, I don't even know anymore, I talked about the Atlantic world and these African sailors who were sailing to the Americas. And in that story I mentioned the Portuguese explorations down the African coast. And it's in that context that we get this Gomez story. But what is most notable and most important to understand in terms of race and racism is that in the 15th century, the 1400s, when the Portuguese explorers begin sailing down the African coast, their goal is to bypass all of the territories of Islamic leaders. They're trying to go around Islam to make it to China because Islam is a rising power. The Turks are carving out this huge empire. And so the dividing line in the European mind in this period is religion. Their primary concern is, are you Christian or are you a pagan, infidel, non-believer? And in fact, and Kendi tells this story and it's pretty wide, widely known at this point, even the term slave comes from the word Slav, and Slavic people are the Eastern European peoples, and they were the last major slave population in Europe. And the reason why is because they were pagans. They were not Christians yet. And so the Germanic peoples, the Franks, the whatever, used to raid into these territories and kidnap all of these white pagans and enslave them. And so they make the, the line about religion. And from the Christian point of view, anybody who wasn't a Christian was fair game for slavery. In Islam, it's a little more complicated. Although like most religious edicts, it gets set aside when it, it's inconvenient. But technically, officially, under Islam, infidels and non-believers could be enslaved but not people of the book, not people who believed in the one God. So in other words, from the Islamic point of view, Christians could not be enslaved, Jews could not be enslaved, and Zoroastrians could not be enslaved, and most definitely not fellow Muslims. 
But as we know, when people begin to seek power or see an advantage, edicts like that begin to fall by the wayside. And of course, the the Muslim Turks, the Ottomans and the Seljuks will begin enslaving, kidnapping Christian children in the Balkans, converting to Islam and turning them into soldiers, the Janissary Corps. So Muslims will set that aside. And of course, Christians will invent racism. So where do where where does it go and what do i mean about race and racism and and whatnot so the portuguese are living at the very edge of europe they are cut off by powerful two powerful spanish kingdoms <clears throat> they discover better sailing boats so they begin trying to sail down the african coast to find their way to china and the wealth of the chinese empire when they begin meeting African kings, they begin to trade with these African kings. And also, sometimes, occasionally, just go into Africa and just snatch people. This trade with African kings involves what the African kings themselves were trading, which is agricultural products and cloth, iron work when they get further down, and people. Uh, the the African continent, like the European continent and the Asian continent and the Americas, had practiced slavery to a large degree. In the case of Africa, and this is what we call the geographic interpretation of history, and uh, attributed to people like Fernand Braudel in the past, and also Felipe Fernandez Armesto, uh, say that you know you look at what exists in a land and a world, and it suggests what their priorities would be. In the case of Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, below the desert, there is just an abundance of natural resources. And so from the African perspective, the resources are all there for the harvesting. They just need the harvesting. And what that means is there is a great degree of human trafficking in Africa because wealthy kings just want people to harvest all the resources and so they need people power to harvest resources and so they have a major slave trade there had already been a trans-saharan slave trade where sub-saharan africans these pagan infidels that muslims were allowed to enslave would be enslaved off the uh, the coasts of, of west africa marched across the sahara and sold into slavery in north africa so this slave trade already exists now the portuguese grab it and portugal is in a similar situation as some of these african kingdoms in that as a small isolated geographically speaking kingdom they don't have a large population and so their economic development was stalled and so the kings of portugal begin immediately trading in human life and that builds Portugal into a major power in the world uh, because they use this African enslaved labor to develop their economy, to farm, to build, to plant, to staff their ships, right? The Portuguese Navy has a great many African sailors that will sail with it. And eventually by the 1670s, I remember a few weeks ago, I posted the picture, cities like Lisbon, uh, probably Oporto, um, Coimba, are cities that have a very large African presence and not entirely enslaved either, a great number of free people as well. And by the 1470s, the Portuguese have managed to bypass Muslim Africa and have made it to Congo where the Congolese convert to Christianity. They become Roman Catholics and they established trade relationships and diplomatic relationships. <clears throat> and Kendi even talked about that the original book by Gomez from the 1450s, in which he threw together all the, 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 the people that he called the Kingdom of Guinea, all these Guineans, Guineans, and he says, look, we, I wrote a history of these people, and these people are not Congolese. So this book that lumps all of West Africans together was presented to the King of Congo, Afonso, to teach him about these people that he didn't know either because he's in West Central Africa and they're in Northwest Africa. And it lumps them all together. 
but even then kind of more scientific notions of racism don't exist from the point of view of a christian monarch these individuals were weird and different and inferior because they weren't christians the reality that uh, or the idea that there is a reality of racial hierarchy still doesn't exist the portuguese naturally will privilege themselves but they thought they were better than the Spanish and better than the Turks and better than everybody else anyway, right? It's that kind of national chauvinism thing. But the large number of Africans who are living in Portugal alongside the Portuguese and mixing with the Portuguese and, and whatnot suggests that notions of some inherent difference don't exist in the Portuguese. And the history of Florida, you know, in the 1560s suggests again that even though there is acknowledgement in reality that people are different from each other and have different cultures the main issue is still but are you a christian after the reformation it becomes are you a catholic because protestants are considered apostates who broke away from the catholic church and or if you're a protestant catholics are kind of weird tyrannical apost you know that religious back and forth so where do we start to finally get something we'll call scientific racism well in part it's because of slavery. And so when we talk about the history of racism or racial ideas, slavery helps create them. But not just slavery, but slavery is a major driving force for the scientific portion. Because when Christopher Columbus and his multi ethnic crew of Europeans and Africans crosses to the Bahamas, in 1492, he discovers a land that nobody in Europe or Africa reportedly knew existed. And the Americas introduced a interesting, an interesting crisis of faith because for Catholics and Christians, although again, they were all still Catholics in 1492 or Orthodox in the East, Eastern Europe, um, the Bible was the source of the source of all truth and all knowledge. And if the Bible is the source of all truth and all knowledge, how come the Bible doesn't mention the Americas? How could there be such a major blind spot in the Bible? And so this crisis of faith kind of shakes things up a little. People are like, well, maybe the Bible doesn't have all the answers. Or maybe the Bible is true, but it doesn't talk about everything. And so it, in a sense, helps crack open that door. And in the 1500s, not only do we have the Protestant Reformation, but we have Galileo's battles with the Catholic Church over science and reasoning. And we have the beginnings of this renaissance, this rebirth of European learning and wisdom. And I say specifically European learning and wisdom because a lot of the, the work that Galileo was doing in astronomy and mathematics and whatnot was work which Islamic scholars in Africa, we're already doing uh, in the Kingdom of Mali around Timbuktu and uh, the Kingdom of uh, Kanem-Bornu. So uh, not to say fully that he's reinventing the wheel, because in fact, one of the things that Galileo did was draw upon the work of Islamic African scholars to then build up, build on top of their work, right? So as slavery grows in the Americas, there's also a European sensibility of now there's a whole new land of pagans and infidels and savages. And the notion is that these people are inferior. And you see a mixture of relationships. The Spanish and Portuguese brutalize the native population. I mean, slaughter, violence, and whatnot. But they also convert them. So those that convert are then somehow, you know, better welcomed in. They live at the missions. They become acculturated, right? So you can look at it as the Spanish and Portuguese. First, it's a horrific nightmare of slaughter and violence. But then there is almost a cultural genocide, but even then not entirely because it's very clear in the Americas that Roman Catholic practice in Spanish-speaking countries and Brazilian countries absorbs a lot of native traditions and native holidays and festivals, and they kind of mix Catholic and native traditions together.
by the time the English get involved, there is a well-developed slave trade based on Roman law, Roman Catholic law, and there's a great deal of intermixing in the Portuguese and Spanish lands between native people, African people, and Spanish and Portuguese and, and European peoples. Like even in Florida, there's Irish and German Catholics living there. So there's a lot of intermixing. And again, their main concern is, what is your faith? Do you pray in the right church? And if not, then we can enslave you, we can kill you, we can do hor horrifying things to you. It's the English and the Dutch to a lesser degree, but the English who begin to change the calculus. English national identity develops on a, on a national basis. Uh, starting with Queen Elizabeth in the 1580s, she begins to define a special sort of Englishness that differentiates the English from the Spanish and the Scottish and whatnot. And we see a lot of rhetoric from the English in the 1580s about what a bunch of savages and untrustworthy, you know, monsters the Spanish are. And these are fellow white people, right? Fellow Europeans. And they de deploy the same sort of vicious rhetoric against them as part of their fight. When the English get to the New World and they begin settling, they first work with the natives and then in classic Christian tradition begin slaughtering them. But the advent of slavery in Virginia was sloppy because the English were not a slave society. Um, they were a massively unequal exploitative society, right? The, the Jamestown colony is primarily indentured servants who were essentially enslaved for a period of time, but it was a period of time, not lifetime slavery. And English sensibilities was such that if you are noble, you are good. And if you are peasant, you are trash. And even though we're all English, you're still trash. And Africans were lumped into that because when they come over, they're indentured servants and they're not English and we don't like them. Um, we use them up and then we can free them. But what that also means is that Africans in the first 30, 40 years after their arrival in Jamestown are attaining freedom, becoming landowners, intermarrying with other lowly indentured servants, and building uh, a multiracial, multi-ethnic society. The word race, as it finally emerges, is related to roots. Like, where do your roots lie? And even that word and idea comes from the fact that there is a more mobile society emerging in the Atlantic world. So I live in Virginia, but what is your roots? Well, I'm English because I'm from England or I'm Spanish because I'm from Spain, even though I live in Florida. And so even there, the first kind of deployment of that word has to do with acknowledging this reality of people moving around throughout this Atlantic world and where then is the originating point of you or your family. So like, yeah, I live in North Carolina, but I'm Scottish because my roots are in Scotland. I am rooted in Scotland and it doesn't have these racial connotations. I am rooted in Africa. I am rooted in wherever, right? And we know that the racial divide is not that strong because of the 1676 Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. Uh, the British royal governor, Berkeley, was awful from the point of view of all the poor Irish, Scottish, and English, and African indentured servants. And increasingly, there was already some uh, Africans who were sentenced to life indenture, i.e. slavery, lifetime slavery at this point, uh, because of, in a second. So the Bacon's Rebellion involved all of those people. Africans, Europeans, all worked together in rebellion against Governor Berkeley. And just to show, again, kind of these roots or whatever, their first target was actually Native Americans because they wanted land for themselves. 
And so the Europeans and the Africans who revolt in Bacon's Rebellion, they go after the Native Americans first because they were mad the governor of Virginia wasn't clearing them off the land, ethnic cleansing of Native Americans, because they felt that after their indenture was over, part of the indenture contract is I get land of my own. And so the, the sense was we are all contractually bound under an English king, and these other people, these Powhatan natives, are the ones that are the outgroup. And so we went after them first, and then they burned Jamestown to the ground. And what we see after the 1676 Bacon's Rebellion is the government of the Virginia colony deciding that they needed to find a way to drive a wedge between the poorest indentured servant class. And the easiest and most obvious wedge they could drive would be based on skin color. And if you were to survey, and I believe I covered this a few weeks ago when I talked about Virginia inventing slavery, if you survey the Virginia laws about slavery and servitude and laws regulating servants and whatever, the first 20, 30 years, the word Christian appears over and over and over again. And after the 1670s, we begin to see the word Christian replaced with the word white. Uh, there are also circumstances where we see the word English appear, which points to this English special status. And that's what I'm talking, that's what I was referring to before is that the English special status meant that people who had roots in England, English people, were special. So Africans were not special, but neither were Scottish, neither were Welsh, and neither were Irish. So the other indentured peoples who were not English were also not special. But see, the Welsh came under the King of England, so then they had certain rights, and then eventually the Scots would be under the King of England. Actually, the Scottish King becomes the King of England, James I. And so the Scots then get special rights. The Irish would be almost completely excluded forever from those special rights under the English crown. And so there is that kind of sensibility like yeah you're Scottish so you're kind of you're closer to English than an African is but you're still not fully English and so we see these gradations already but even then the gradations are not based on some sort of skin color they're based on you are rooted in a kingdom that belongs to us or does not belong to us or that is the core of our empire or it's not the core of our empire but after Bacon's rebellion Virginia starts passing these laws that ban intermarriage and ban and specifically single out Negroes or black people as ones that are going to be separate. And of course, even the word Negro is just Negro is the Spanish word for black. So it's a descriptive. It was a descriptive to show like, yeah, Negros. So the people who are from Africa who are different from the people from Europe who are Blancos or Biancos or whatever. Right. And so skin skin is our largest organ right you can see it most visibly but we know later on of course that eye color and hair and all these other things factor into it as well so the english begin driving this wedge because they don't want a repeat of bacon's rebellion and they begin passing ever more restrictive laws aimed at separating and as part of that separation it's aimed at specifically legally elevating white people over black people and what I mean is not to say that white people are elevated. They're still here. They still consider the white servant class to be garbage, but they're garbage that's free garbage as opposed to the African population that now is lifetime in slavery and they're different and you're not like them, don't work with them. And of course they begin passing laws banning uh, marriage between Europeans and Africans and, and all of this stuff. And the goal is to separate people from each other. If they don't know each other, if they're not friends, then we can break up that interracial coalition. And this is, I mean, this is a tactic that persists for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades. For example, just to jump ahead a 200 years. In 1883 in Western Pennsylvania, there is a strike, the Homestead Strike. Um, it's a mill that belongs to Carnegie, an, uh, an iron worker, a steel mill. And the workers go on strike, and the workers were all immigrants. 
Irish, Czech, and whatever, all white. When they go on strike and refuse to work, Henry K. Clay Frick, who was the fixer, he hires exclusively African Americans as the strike breakers. So, you know, 100 workers go on strike, he hires 100 African Americans who didn't have jobs, and then tries to send them to the mill to reopen the mill and go to work. So what does that mean? That means that the Czechs and the Irish see the African Americans as their enemies and the African Americans who now finally had a shot at a job see the Czechs and the Irish as their enemies and they're busy fighting each other. But of course, Henry Clay Frick and, and Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie are the puppet masters at the top making all the money. And this is part of Kendi's point is that race has always been used as just another signifier to divide people and so that people who have power and exploit the labor of others can continue to do so. So how does it get to science? Because it's been a half hour already. So as part of this evolution of the enlightenment and scientific reasoning, we see the emergence of a field called natural philosophy. And there's a big part of it that happens right here in Philadelphia. Uh, John Bartram Oh, has this garden or in his property, Bartram's Gardens, which is just in southwest Philly, he begins describing and characterizing the the flora and fauna in his neighborhood. He begins describing the differences between plants and animals in the Americas, which again, it was by this point 150 or 170 years since Columbus had first landed in the Americas, but the animals that were here were completely different, well, except for buffalo, bison, um, were largely different, there we go, were largely different from what existed in Europe. So there was this fascination with this different natural world that existed in the Americas. Bartram begins categorizing it and describing it, and he writes all these books. And then eventually, we have a Swiss botanist named Carolus Linnaeus, who will formalize categories by which we organize the description of all life. So kingdom, phylum, genus, species, monera, all these different things. In other words, like it is Carolus Linnaeus who comes up with the term homo sapiens, thinking man. Uh, and all of those scientific Latin names that you've heard of for different species of plants and animals, that's the Linnaean system of categorization. And the idea, the basic idea in terms of science is if we can categorize and understand everything, existence, then we can study it more effectively and begin to understand it. And Linnaeus will, of course, as part of his descriptives, describe things like skin color, hair texture, eye color, etc. But even then, he, of course, likes his own people best, but even then he's not necessarily talking about some sort of inherent differences or some people are inherently slaves or whatever. But of course, those profiting from the trade in slavery or those who are keeping people as slaves immediately see opportunities. And Linnaeus is writing in the 1730s. And at that time, people begin to say like, oh, well, you know, Maybe this and maybe that. There is um, a French guy named Buffon, yeah, Buffon, Buffon, who describes the first, which ultimately is kind of accurate in terms of account of human difference. And Buffon basically says, you notice that the closer you get to the equator, the darker the people are. And what Buffon argued was that people have dark skin because they're in the sun. In other words, it's like a super tan, and that if you took people who were dark skin and moved them out, they would just lighten up. So that was wrong, but he was on the right track, because what instead we know from contemporary real science, as opposed to the pseudoscientific crap I'm talking about now, is that as you move further north, people are lighter skinned. But that is hundreds, if not thousands, of generations of evolution that the melanin gene, which provides darkness, um, melanin protects from exposure to the sun's rays. And that is a useful adaptation in the 
closer to the hemisphere where the sun is more intensive because it protects the skin. But as you move further north and there's less sun, well, sun also is what activates the production of vitamin D. So if individuals are living further and further and further north towards the equator, there's less and less sun. If the sun's beams are not reaching them because of the melanin, they're not making as much vitamin D, they're less healthy. And so the gene that produces melanin increasingly turned off and people became lighter. So it, not on an individual basis, but over the long span of evolution, we see these gradations in skin color among people. But Buffon's close, but he doesn't quite get it. So how do we end up with scientific racism? Well, at the time of the American Revolution, there is still a lot of questions. And slavery is hot in the minds of individuals who are considering the nature of freedom and liberty and the arguments that the revolutionaries are making. And they're thinking to themselves like, well, we, we argue that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Hmm. And as I was talking about the last couple of weeks, there is an aggressive activist abolition movement including with a great many Europeans who were saying slavery is fundamentally wrong and at odds with the principles of equality in the revolution. And so there is the conundrum. The revolution is fought in America. And by the way, scientific racism is largely created in this country. There is this conundrum. We fought a revolution. We said all men are created equal and down by their creator and whatever. So, but how do we reconcile that with the practice of keeping certain people as slaves and how we reconcile that with an already existing body of laws we've passed, which separate and single people out on the basis of their skin color? Well, Thomas Jefferson, he who wrote all men are created equal is of course the man who two years later begins to argue why two, why all men are not created equal. And Jefferson, and I, I believe I provided this to you a couple weeks ago, his notes on the state of Virginia, he begins laying out these differences between Europeans and Africans as he sees them. And one of the first things he talks about is he even says, he says the first, I'm reading, I'm not gonna read too much, I promise. The first difference which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black of the Negro resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and scarf skin, or in the scarf skin itself, whether it proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from that of some other secretion, the difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. So he's like, I don't know why people have different skin colors, but they do, and it's real. He then proceeds to lay out why white people are prettier. And then he lays out the fundamental basis of American scientific racism. I'm gonna read you a little bit more, sorry. They have less hair on the face and body. They secrete less by the kidneys and more by the glands of the skin. What he means is, according to Jefferson, African people pee less and sweat more. And I always, when I teach this, I always say to my students, yeah, because when I'm spending 12 hours in a tobacco field in a hot Virginia summer, I'm sweating a lot and there's no water left to pee. So yeah, I sweat more and pee less. Uh, I don't get to sit inside my house reading books like you do, TJ. So you get the idea. Then he says, a black, after hard labor through the day, will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up till midnight, or later, though knowing he must be out at the first dawn of morning. They seem to require less sleep. And again, if you remember a few weeks ago I talked about resistance, being human is resistance. And if African Americans and Africans on Thomas Jefferson's plantation, after 12 hours of awful backbreaking work decided they wanted to be human and sing some songs or tell some stories or share social gatherings it's not because they require less sleep 
it's because human beings require human interaction and human creativity and they were sacrificing sleep to assert and be human to resist the conditions of their enslavement but again thomas jefferson has experienced what, what we call motivated reasoning or cognitive bias he is trying to show people are inferior so he's going to interpret everything as if they are inferior whereas my cognitive bias is that everyone is equal so i'm going to assert and explain and interpret differences by virtue of that all people are equal and have the same basic human needs um, he then goes on to talk about africans being more emotional uh better at dancing i kid you not the stereotype of, of africans being good dancers goes back to here uh, better at music brave um, less forethought. Uh, ironically, he says Africans need less sleep, but then he says that whenever an African doesn't have work to do, he falls asleep. And he says it's because they're just not that intelligent. And I'm like, no, it's because they're tired. <laughs> but again, Jefferson, motivated reasoning. The irony, of course, is Jefferson carries on in 1778 saying, you know, how ugly uh, or how less attractive African people are. And then, of course, he has five black kids <laughs> of his own. And he spends 40 years of his life, well, not 40 years, 20, 30 years of his life lusting after Sally Hemings and raping her and impregnating her with children, starting when she was, I think, like 15 or 16 years old, and he was 40. So he's also, you know, like a pedophile. Um, so, yeah, so you have all that, that irony. And Jefferson lays that out there. And what Jefferson is basically doing in, in what is a rather irrational eruption of craziness is he is the author of some of the highest-minded principles of the American Revolution. And he immediately recognizes that these principles are incompatible with the very institution by which he is exploiting sex from a young girl and exploiting the labor of hundreds of people to make his life wealthy and comfortable. And he doesn't want to give up the comforts of his life or Sally Hemings, because he never freed her. And so he has to find a way to reconcile these two differences. And so his reconciliation is humans might be humans but some are more human than others to quote orwell uh, or to paraphrase george orwell in animal farm in other words like yeah there's different types of humans just like there's different breeds of dogs and different breeds of horses like some horses are for racing and some are for dragging heavy loads and so we fit into our position and so from jefferson's perspective he's jefferson and he's a white european so our position as white europeans is to be the brilliant thinking kind but the africans are for the labor and that type of a thing and so he's trying to categorize nature in a very self-serving way and part of this this motivation or part of what we see in this time period and this is something i'm actually studying right now so don't hold me 100 percent to this but i feel pretty confident making this assertion that when we examine revolutionary era racial talk, the fear among Europeans was that Africans were sort of a culturally different, almost, they not almost, they were barbarians. And these are people who were very consciously aware of the Roman Empire and Roman history, in which the Roman Empire was brought down by these foreign barbarians, Goths and Visigoths and Vandals and Alemanni and all these different tribes, Lombards, who came into the Roman Empire and destroyed it from within and then invaded it from without and all of this other stuff. And so they think, they look at Africans as barbarians. They look at Africans as people who are not cultural and civilized. And this is classic this is this this is an adaptation of that classic english chauvinism the english denounced the spanish as savage barbarians right but now they're like well it's these africans it's these this this secret group that we've brought into our own midst and they are a threat to us and so jefferson 
proposes, and this goes back to my colonization episode, he proposes ending slavery and sending all Africans out of the country. His goal is, uh, well, if we get rid of them, then we don't have to worry about them and we can create our new Rome or our new Republic without the problems of that troublesome diversity that brought down the Roman Empire. So there's a lot of evidence of this. Uh, no one, I haven't read any book that pulls it all together, but I'm working on it. But even Phyllis Wheatley, the, the African poet, she even described herself as an uncultivated barbarian who was touched by Christianity. So there's definitely this notion of somehow African barbarism. But Jefferson also says the same thing about Native Americans, right? Native Americans are savages. They are culturally inferior. They are backward civilization. And of course, in the case of Native Americans in the 1780s and 90s, the Native Americans that are resisting American expansion in early America are essentially the survivors of a centuries long extermination and pestilence, right? Native American populations are decimated by diseases. And so native civilizations, they don't collapse in the sense that they cease to exist. They exist, they persist. But when you have 100 million people and you're reduced to 10 million people, you simply don't have the economy and the luxury to build as greatly as you built in the past. And so native civilizations were struggling to rebuild themselves in this time period as they're being constantly decimated by waves of smallpox and whatnot, and also fighting off European invaders who were seizing their land and African invaders who were seizing their land, right? Bacon's Rebellion in Florida. And so, you know, Jefferson is like looking at native people. And he's like, yeah, they're not really whatever. But he does argue because native people were no longer being enslaved, that they could be mixed into the American population and become Americans if we just get the savage out of them, that they could be turned into Americans. So Jefferson is basically advocating the deportation and ethnic cleansing of African Americans and ending slavery and the eradication of all Native American culture and the absorption of Native people into European society both of which will manifest in later American policy. So where do we get then scientific racism? Holy cow, I've been talking 47 minutes of just getting here. Oh, I'm sorry. So why scientific racism? I might have to make this a two-parter. Well, slavery is on its way out, right? Then uh, Gabriel's rebellion in 1800 still believed in a multi-ethnic, multi-racial alliance. He still believed Europeans would stand with Africans on behalf of abolition, on behalf of liberty, Gabriel. And that hope, which no doubt emerged from the reality that the Continental Army that fought and won American independence was an army of black men and white men, and even some native people, all fighting side by side, right? So there are these instances of multi-ethnic cooperation. There are laws freeing people. There is an increasing population of free people of color in early America as a consequence of people making the more enlightened decision that, yeah, our revolution was based on human equality. Slavery is incompatible with human equality, so let's end slavery. Rush Jefferson is like, let's pretend that they're not humans. What will eventually give force to these studies is that um, is the cotton gin, right? Slavery is going out the door, but when cotton becomes a much more profitable crop as a consequence of the cotton gin, whose patent, ironically, not ironically, predictably, was granted by Thomas Jefferson when he was Secretary of State, creates a demand for labor. And so enslavers who had seen the profits from slavery declining now have a new way to make profits from slavery, and we see the reversal 
of this trend. Gabriel's rebellion puts that fear into the the planter elite in Virginia that these re these rebels who have been forging these multiracial coalitions going back to 1676 in Virginia need to be separated even further. And so as as people like Kendi and others have put it, they decided that they're going to make mass uh, plantations for cotton and they're going to hire the white people to crack the whips. The poor white people to crack the whips. And through the early 1800s, we see kind of the, the petering out of a kind of broad-based abolition coalition. And when I talked about Richard Allen a few weeks ago, I mentioned the, the convention about colonization. And the fact that the colonization is still on the agenda means that people are still thinking about abolishing slavery and Europeans and Africans going their separate ways in the Americas. But when the planters take over colonization, James Monroe and his people, and they create Liberia, it turns colonization into a movement to maintain slavery. And so they work towards that goal, but as they're working to expand and maintain slavery, they need more justification because there is a growing rhetoric of democratic equality in the Americas in the second generation of, of independence. And so how can we spread a rhetoric of freedom and liberty and equality, but at the same time still keep slavery? How can we give more and more landless white people the vote, but still shut out these African people who might use their vote to complicate slavery? This is where we will see the birth of scientific racism. And so just like that first wave of the abolition movement is very much emergent in the Delaware Valley, so too will scientific racism be emergent in the Delaware Valley. I think I'm going to have to make this a two-parter because I'm already at an hour and I haven't even gotten to the main show. So this is going to be a two-parter, but I'm going to I'm going to bring off these pieces around the same time that Richard Allen is pushing and the the colonization movement and this kind of last gasps of abolitionism in the North. There is a new natural historian or natural researcher, scientist, organizer, and his name is Johann Blumenbach. And Johann Blumenbach takes the work of Carolus Linnaeus, whom I mentioned earlier, and he builds on that work. And he publishes a book called Types of Mankind. And Blumenbach's work separates humans into five types. Linnaeus had come up with four, Blumenbach has five. And Blumenbach's Types of Mankind breaks us down by color. So he, we are white, red, yellow, black, and brown. And essentially, white are Europeans, red are natives, black are Africans, yellow are East Asians, and brown are South Asians, Arabs, uh, people from... Uh, the like my Polynesian peoples and whatever are brown people, right? Broad swaths. But even in Bloom, Blumenbach's categorization, these are simply descriptive differences. In other words, he acknowledges himself that he has a preference. He prefers his people. Um, it's Blumenbach who actually coins the term Caucasian because he believes that the the white people who live in the Caucasus Mountains, i.e. Georgians, Armenians, and Aziris, although ironically, Aziris and Armenians are now at war again, that those are the most beautiful people ever. Caucasians, those from the Caucasus. And yeah, French and Swedish and whatever, they're close enough that they're also very pretty. 
but that your distance from Caucasian is your prettiness. So most white people are closer to Caucasians than everyone else. But nonetheless, it's simply because Blumenbach believes that, you know, people who look like him are the prettiest. But he doesn't say such things as like, as Jefferson said uh, 30 years earlier. He's not saying things like, oh, Africans dance better or they don't need to sleep or whatever nonsense. Blumenbach is like, look, here's the description. In the same way I might describe different types of roses and be like, here's a red rose and here's a yellow rose and some have lots of petals and some have few petals, some have thorns, some don't. And they're all roses and it doesn't matter so don't worry about it. And you might like red roses best, or you might like yellow roses best, but you can't deny they're all still roses. That's Blumenbox, types of mankind. We all might have preferences for our own kind, our own type, people that look most familiar, most similar to us, but in the end, we're all still human. But he gives us this typography. He gives us this red, black, brown, white, yellow thing. And it's exactly that type of work, which if it falls into the wrong hands, can lead to the development of a horrifying racial hierarchy. And the wrong hands belong to Samuel George Morton, who is an Irish-born American from Philadelphia, who is associated with the then recently created Academy of Natural Sciences of Philadelphia. And Samuel George Morton will take Blumenbach's work, which was not written in English, written in German, and he will translate it into English. And by translate, I mean interpret it in a very useful way you see and yeah it's definitely going to be a two-parter by the 1820s there is an increasing population of irish immigrants to the americas and some are protestant there was an 1818 or 1819 rebellion that failed which unleashed a wave of migration from ireland to the americas and the Irish are systematically discriminated against by the English and those descended from the English. They don't like the Irish. And so as the Irish are coming into America's cities, they find themselves discriminated against and, and occupying the bottom rung of society. But when they go into places like Charleston or Savannah, the planters realize or the planters actually believe because they believe that the irish are savage and violent people they believe the irish are perfect to be the plantation overseers and so they hire these white people whom they consider to be violent and savage to be the people whose supposed violence and savagery can keep enslaved people in line and so we see Irish and African Americans being put against each other. And Morton's Irish. Morton, of course, cares about his own people um, more so. Uh, but he wants to justify. Also, at this time, there is the movement for increased voting rights. And again, African Americans in, in the northern states who own property are allowed to vote. And these landless immigrants are not allowed to vote. And so again, they have an incentive in creating a white identity that can give them rights and opportunities, even if it denies others rights and opportunities, because I don't care about other people's rights and opportunities. I care about mine and my family and my friends and my neighborhood. And it becomes a vicious zero sum game. Didn't have to be, but it be comes a vicious zero-sum game, and one which will be replicated for decades in American history. And in fact, there is this crazy theory, uh, historical theory, that the reason why American democracy is able to expand, in other words, more people voting and more voting rights and whatever, 
is because of racism, because by the 1820s, they're able to create a racial identity of whiteness that implies and confers citizenship that breaks the old class-based identity and class structure, which again, Bacon's Rebellion and Gabriel's Rebellion and these types of things had drawn upon consistently as a means of uh, creating democracy. In other words, this theory goes that if the United States had been an exclusively European dominated society, it would not have had more expansive democratic principles because the powers that be, those wealthy upper crust types, wouldn't have been able to use the race card and wouldn't have been able to buy off the loyalty of the lower classes by playing the race card, which they would eventually play with scientific racism. And it's, again, we can never know what could have been, right? Because it wasn't. But it is a compelling and terrifying thought that the expansion of democracy in America is because of racism. What evidence there is of this is, and I've mentioned this a couple times, is that in 1835 or 36 in Pennsylvania, right, so major immigrant state, large Irish Catholic population, which was oppressed and discriminated against aggressively, well, they had voting rights, thanks to Andrew Jackson's kind of popular democratic machine. And they and the anti-Masons and others won the Pennsylvania legislature, and they moved for a constitutional convention, which in 1837 in Pennsylvania specifically gave voting rights to all white Pennsylvanians and took away voting rights from African Americans deliberately. In other words, they abolished the property requirement by replacing it with a race requirement. And that, in a nutshell, is what's happening in America, that a class-based system where property owners have all the privilege transforms into a race-based system where the skin becomes the property where whiteness is the property. And this is something, again, you'll find books all over the place about whiteness as property. And so white people can feel at least that they own their whiteness, even though they're completely marginalized economically, which is the case in the South and a lot of America, where a very, particularly in the South of this time period, very few people owned land. Most white people are landless renters and whatever, and yet they can own their whiteness and this is historians like David Rodiger and Joe Fagan uh, talk about this when they talk about understanding whiteness. And so this is uh, this huge fund this huge basis for it. But I only touched on the beginnings of scientific racism. My God, uh, this is a two parter. I'm going to change the name of this video to to scientific racism part one an introduction. And I'm going to have to resume this next week because I probably have about another hour's worth of, of discussion here. Wow. I didn't expect it to take that. I was worried I wouldn't have enough to talk about, believe it or not. So, all right. It's been an hour and three minutes. Uh, understand that there's a good chance I'm going to answer your questions next week when I pick up more on Samuel Morton and others, Louis Agassiz, Josiah Knott, uh, the, the great historian or the great anthropologists of race and racism. Also people like Charles Benedict Davenport, Madison Grant, American eugenics. Yeah. There's a lot of ugly to cover still. But understand that in large part, what we look at when we consider racism is racism is invented. Excuse me, race is invented, leading to racism because certain people basically didn't want to give up the practice of keeping humans as slaves. And... And this is the big and, and this is, sometimes we give, we, we give it short shrift, but it matters. We also wanted to justify, in a, in a country that talks about sacred property rights and your right to property, well, if, sacred, if property rights are sacred, well, then how do we justify the fact that people lived here 
and we stole all their land. Because wouldn't their property rights also be sacred? Right. And so we see racism develop as a means essentially to justify taking land from African uh, from Native Americans, depriving them of their so-called sacred property rights, and then keeping African Americans as slaves, depriving them of their sacred liberty. And if these things are sacred, i.e. religious, what's your antidote? Science. But it's actually pseudoscience. And Jay's asking about the, the John Brown show. I just learned about it ne uh, last week. I'm super excited to see it. I saw an interview with Christian, uh, not Christian Bale, Ethan Hawke about it. I always confuse those two with Ethan Hawke about it. I'm really psyched to see it. I think it's going to be great. Ethan Hawke does some good filmmaking. So I'm psyched. Uh, and I suspect it's going to be very good just from the, the excerpts I've seen. And Ethan Hawke says he tried to kind of tell the story in a respectful way but also make it kind of more entertaining and even funny bits, kind of highlighting some of the absurdities and the idealism of Brown. Uh, so if you have Showtime, watch the John Brown miniseries. John Brown is a classic example of revisionist history because the man is a hero for freedom. And since then, good Lord Bird. Thank you, Nicole. It's called the good Lord Bird. He, the man is a hero for freedom, and yet they paint him as a fanatic and a lunatic simply because... He's fighting for the freedom of African-Americans, so thus he must be crazy. Whereas, of course, Barry Goldwater, senator from Arizona, specifically said in 1964, extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. And yet John Brown, who leads a rebellion, is considered an extremist and a crazy man and wild-eyed. So they say all sorts of stuff. But yeah, Ethan Hawke is very good. I'm looking forward to the show. Uh, maybe we can talk about it one week. I, we can, Although if the show will cover all of John Brown's rebellion and plots and all the fun stuff he did, which some of it was pretty scary, uh, then I might not have to cover it, but we'll see. Maybe we'll, have the, we'll, we'll, we'll do the week of representations in film and media. So we'll talk about 12 Years a Slave and John Brown and Underground and Harriet. We'll see. But anyway, this is only going to be part one. Next week, I will begin with Samuel George Morton in Philadelphia at the Academy of Natural Sciences. I'm going to share just a couple of links today because a lot of the links that I have are on Morton. What I will say specifically in terms of kind of like knowing your sources, Samuel Morton studied human skulls. I'll talk about it next week. And his collection is at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. And I have photographs that I've taken because I've been in his collection because I have worked at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. So yeah, Nicole, maybe we should do that. Well, maybe we can have some sort of a, 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 a ranging video discussion on some of these things at some point. Yeah, that'll be a good idea when I run out of ideas. So anyway, if anyone has any questions about the material that I covered today, please ask them now, understanding that this is just part one and I've been building. I, I laid a lot of groundwork for a lot of stuff that's to come and that I, I've probably got another hour's worth of material pretty easily for next week. So anyone have any questions out there? In summary, or just to remind you, the line between slavery and freedom was religious. Human difference was seen and acknowledged, but wasn't given as much credence and as much power as it later is given. And what gives it that is the fact that the line on religion was not sufficient. And so slavers, enslavers wanted a new excuse that would be compatible or that they could twist to fit with the American society they were building. And they found their answer in science, which we know is of course pseudoscience. 
and that all of it is tossed out the window. And pretty early on, Du Bois is already is already tearing up a lot of that BS in the 1890s. So anyway, alrighty. Uh, if there aren't any more questions, I will pick this up again next week, starting with Morton and the Skulls. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can throw up that link to Jefferson again, if those of you want to read his appalling nonsense. And, hmm, yeah, I'm going to save the other links for next week. So those of you, and I always tell you about checking sources and trusting sources, I don't want to spoil the surprise. But next week I will provide you tons and tons of links, okay, so you can read up and really deepen your knowledge and understanding on this. Okay? All right, everybody. I'm going to call it a day because I have a course to teach this evening, so i got to shift my, shift my mindset a little bit. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I, I hope you learned stuff. I hope that you share what you've learned the way I share with you what I have learned, and hopefully we can help create a much more better informed empathetic, compassionate, and productive society this way. So have a wonderful afternoon. I'll see you next week for part two. Bye. Enjoy your day. Eat good food and be happy.